So this is part of a presentation that Janet talked me into doing about, about eight months ago, nine months ago. It was supposed to be for gearing up, but now it's turned into this and it's going to now it has turned into for mini college. So this is a section of what will be a longer presentation that will cover more elements at mini college. What I'm. Oh, I don't care. Okay, well. um, uh, this is focused primarily on ornamental plants. Um, the longer presentation will talk about other strategies beyond just plant selection. So those of you who are primarily uh, vegetable gardeners, uh, bear with me, number one. But secondly, you have somewhere in your yard, whether it's just the front yard for public viewing or whatever, where this might prove useful to you. So here we go. So making smart plant choices for less work. Uh, this one. Okay, so what am I pressing to get the next slide? Where, why isn't that working? Well, it shouldn't. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just looking. I'm just using oh, the arrow key. I used this one. Oh, you used that one? That one should work, Kathy. I have there we go. Okay, so there we go. Okay. So why do we want to work less? It, there are lots of reasons we might want to. Yeah, my body just can't do what it used to, other demands on my time, new interests I want to pursue, or just you want less routine gardening maintenance in order to do other things. For whatever reason, smart plant selection can make the chores lighter and the enjoyment sweeter, which is a big part of it. So what, do, what do I consider smart plant choices? That is making, you have lots of plants you can choose for. Some will give you more work, in my opinion, and some will give you less. So choose a Sasanqua camellia rather than a Japanese camellia. Sasanqua camellias, which bloom more in the late fall and into winter, the flowers shatter, which means they drop their petals individually and it makes that pink snow look on the left. Japanese camellias, the entire bloom falls en masse and lays on the ground and rots and turns brown in the rain and the rest of that and it doesn't just blow away. So there is more work involved in a Japanese camellia. Bearded iris, on the right are notorious for being demanding of division. They will quit blooming. They will turn into a tangled mess. Whereas you can substitute instead some of the Pacific Coast hybrids, which are just as glamorous as the bearded, tall bearded iris or the native Pacific Coast iris or the native tough leaf iris the 10x. So smart plant choices are getting the same general effect in the garden, but giving you less work. First, you need to know yourself and what kind of garden you want. Do you want it well-groomed or casual, full of color or just a serene green? Very formal or more naturalistic? Is it a wildlife haven or an exotic plant collection that you're after? A place to relax or where you can keep moderately busy? And then you need to ask yourself, what are you willing to do to get that? Water frequently, replace underperforming plants, deadhead, divide and trim regularly, tolerate the dropped debris or pay someone to do what you don't. Those are all things. The survey that you have or that was sent to you is getting you to think about where you are in terms of what garden you want and what, <coughs> what you're willing to do to get it. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you work less, what might be the result? So on that survey is your, what I call your tolerance for untidiness and where your comfort level is on that line. 
If you look on the left-hand pictures, they are very tidy, neat as a pin. Actually, those are pretty low maintenance examples. And then as we move toward the center, you have some plants spilling over. You have some plants that some people might think need deadheading unless you're planning to feed the birds. And then as we moved farther to the right, you end up with more of a naturalistic garden, maybe a pollinator friendly garden, but it is not so tidy. So figure out where you are because some of the things we'll be talking about later, I'll say, so where does your tolerance for untidiness place you with this? Then you need to know the challenges of your site. Who visits your garden? <laughs> is your garden a steep hillside? Is it windy, very sunny or shady? What's the condition of your soil? Is it very wet, very dry, dense, heavy? And then the hose over there, what is your access to water? Do you have to drag a hose everywhere to water anything? Or do you have automatic watering? Or no need for watering if you're planning a zero escape, okay? And then finally, to thine own self be true. It's your garden. What I'd like to have you think about is putting your energy into the elements that matter to you. Are you feeding wildlife? Are you simply creating a beautiful scene to look at? Do you want a formal, like that rose garden, a formal feature of a plant collection that's important to you? Are you looking to have an exotic or specialized collection like the picture on the upper right? Those are for the most part, fairly tropical looking plants. The picture at the bottom is an example of a parterre design, but that is actually a vegetable garden. That is somebody's kitchen garden. And they obviously have a very low tolerance for untidiness <laughs> in their vegetable garden. Okay, if what you're wanting is in the center picture on the top center, if what you're wanting is simply a place to relax, to nest, to feel very comfortable in yourself, you might make different areas of your garden that have different characteristics. The front might be very simple, very low maintenance, just something to not have the neighbors get upset. And then the backyard can have a very different flavor but it's your garden, keep that in mind. So one of the things we know about ourselves is we love meeting new plants. <laughs> and where do we find them? How do we run across new plants? Perfectly groomed plants at the nursery parade their best features. They are always well deadheaded, full, ready to be going down the gangway, you know, the, uh, the, the runway. And then we have friends who show up, plant in hand, praising its virtues, telling them how much they love this plant in their own yard. And then this, finally, the supermodels, I succumb to this one, the supermodels of the plant world appear in glossy photo shoots. Which magazine is this, right? And I succumb to the glamor of their star status. This is the new one. This is the new one. I need to dig out the old one and put in the new one because it's that much better. So what could go wrong? I invite them into my garden and take them home. New plants are guests in my garden. Some guests are easygoing, well-mannered, welcome to stay on. But others are demanding, messy, weak-willed, and interfere with other guests. They demand water. They demand fertilizer, extra fertilizer. They, they are messy, dropping things, flopping. <laughs> Weak-willed, it's went from one year to the next. I'm never sure whether it's gonna come back. And they interfere with other guests. They send out runners, they lean on other plants. When my patience is finally overtried, it's time to kick them out. And sometimes they go easily. It's just a shovel needed to move them on, but others leave nasty mementos that long remind me of my hasty invitations. <laughs> 
<laughs> what have I learned? Beware the handsome stranger. These are attractive plants to my mind. It's like, ooh, I could do that. Love those berries. Love the feathery look on that. And so I go, this is a beautiful plant. And what am I to do? How do I find out whether this is that good guest or the one that a couple of years from now I'm gonna regret having taken home? Before you take it home, do a background check. Would you invite someone into your home without knowing a little more about them than the first 10 minutes that you met them? You have to go beyond the nursery tag. Nursery tags tell us less than they used to. They don't even have the zone on them anymore for the most part. I don't know whether you've noticed that or not. They will, they will talk about how lovely it is in bloom and what approximate size it will get. But that size is a 10 year target, which means that 15 years from now, it will be much larger than the space that you allocated it, number one. And number two, it might be much bigger than that because here in Oregon, things grow bigger than they do in other places. So go beyond the nursery tag. Where do you go? You look online at reliable sources, check lists of invasive plants. I would say aggressive plants too, but there aren't very many lists of those. Ask knowledgeable plant friends, what do you know about this plant? and they ask the nursery staff. So then I get to the point of, what do I ask? What am I looking for? These are the seven questions that I ask to minimize garden work so that I don't bring home somebody who doesn't fit in my garden. We'll go over all of these individually, but just to lay them all out for you. And if I'm working with um, somebody at the plant sale, these are the questions that I'm asking. Are you willing to do this? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. What is your garden characteristic? So first, does it fit with my garden's characteristics? What's its staying power? Does it require deadheading to keep blooming? Will it need staking, or training, or regular pr pr pruning? How often does it need dividing to do well? Is it a magnet for trouble? And what are its potential bad behaviors? <laughs> So let's look at those one by one. Does the plant's needs fit my garden's characteristics? Most plants want what they want in order to thrive. It might be the right plant, but do I have the right place for it? We're always talking about right plant, right place. And I'm going, yeah, this is the right plant, this I know. <laughs> but do I in my garden have the right place for it? So think about your garden's characteristics. Is it sunny or shady? or in between? Does it tend to be dry or wet? Do you have a seep running down the back of your fence? Does it have good drainage or heavy soil? Windy or protected? Is it very hot in summer or does it tend to be cooler because of the ambient trees? Are you gonna generously water in summer or not? And is the expected size okay in the intended space? So if you were to look at the garden in the top left, you would say that is sunny. Does it look windy? Not so much, not with those tall plants there probably, or else they're very strong. If you look at the one on the bottom right, sunny again, but very different kind of soil probably. That looks much more like a damp soil to me. So ask yourself, what is your garden like? And what's the plant's staying powder? How long can I expect this plant to stick around? In order to be called a perennial, it only has to live three years. That's the nursery standard, industry standard. For a lower maintenance garden, you're going to want to look for plants to live much garden or else you're going to be constantly digging up, putting something else in, or it's just gonna not thrive, it's just gonna go downhill slowly. 
Shrubs generally age better than herbaceous perennials, though some succumb if soil conditions aren't favorable. For example, some Daphne and Ceanothus can suddenly die if they don't have excellent drainage. They just quit. So there's a nice perennial garden there in that lovely walled garden. So what kinds of perennials are less likely to stay around? That's a list of shorter lived perennials based on the research that I've done. Now, columbine last only because they receive. Yeah. And receive. And receive. <laughs> but mo and Shasta daisies, some of them will do better, but a lot of them simply go downhill and they just don't thrive. In my own yard, I tried Gallardia. Never came. Two years I had it, and then it was like gone. Yeah. So. And new cultivars, I'm always wary of new cultivars. I think sometimes they're released too quickly and they don't last. So those are the ones that are shorter lived. These are longer lived. They live at least five years, most of them much longer. Number three, does the plant require deadheading to keep blooming? Many repeat bloomers will only rebloom if the faded flowers are removed. So a few strategies that work with that. For less work, choose plants that shed their own flowers. The native columbine on the top left will shatter, shed its flowers, and then they bloom in sequence. So it doesn't make a mess. You don't have to deadhead it. It will bloom until it's done, but it doesn't, but even the seed pods are attractive. So it is less work. They bloom once, but for a long time. There are some plants that will only bloom once, but they'll bloom for a month. They can be sheared or cut in a clump. Looking at the, the bottom left, do you want to take off every one of those marigolds one by one? Or do you want to pick it up and a clump and just go whack? Much easier if it can happen that way. They can be grouped together for easier tending. If you look at the pots on the top right, they're all together. So I can take off the dead flowers rather rapidly as opposed to having them spread all through the yard and I have to wander through the whole yard to find them all. They're near a path for easy access. Looking at the picture on the bottom right, I believe those are primroses that are in front of her. And I certainly wouldn't wanna be deadheading all of those. There's very poor access to them. She appears to be on the sidewalk and to reach into all that and get all of the faded flowers would be a lot of work. So put things near a path. If it's something that you know you're going to deadhead, make it so you don't have to climb behind a thorny bush to get there. They are where you are in summer for easy puttering. Again, on the patio, you're there just, you know, taking off a few flowers in the evening feels pleasant, but going halfway across the yard to get it doesn't feel casual. Rebloom without cutting old flowers. For example, profusion zinnias are a favorite of mine because you never deadhead them and the old blooms just fade. They don't look bad. So they go all summer with very little work and bloom the whole summer. Or they have blooms that are simply worth the extra effort to you, whether that's your favorite rose or whatever it is. It's got great blooms and you're willing to put that extra effort into it. Number four, will the plant need staking, corralling, or training? Heavy blooms and vines, by definition, will take extra management. If you look at the delphiniums on the top left, those are magnificent delphiniums, but I'll bet they're staked. <laughs> When you look at the delphiniums in the picture next to them, they're shorter, but they're just as lovely. They're not just, they're not as statuesque, but they're still lovely. It's just a shorter blooming variety. And because it's nestled among the other plants, they're giving some support 
to stay up. That's true of dahlias, lilies, and a lot of zinniums. If you have a lot of afternoon wind the way that we do around here in some areas, they are tending to flop. flop. So what I would do is minimize that work by planting the medium height varieties. Vines always need maintenance. There isn't much to, you just can't avoid it. There are very few that don't need it. So you can minimize that work by establishing a sturdy support from the start or by matching its eventual size to the support or stick to annual vines. They're easy. They just get ripped out at the end of the season. Peonies often need support from hoops, tomato cages, woven tree limb trimmings like the, the illustration on the right, half hoops or lampshade frames, which is something that I use with peonies. Old lampshade frames, just rip off the silk and there you have a wire frame. They last for years and years. Now those supports will work best when placed just after the shoots emerge. The, the picture to the left there with putting the frame on, that's a little late because you have to weave it all through. I put them when, on when they're much shorter than that. And then if you know Monty Don, there he is with his favorite support that he makes simply by bending wire around a sphere or a barrel or something. But they're very effective and cheap. Also, will this shrub need regular pruning? Some shrubs need regular trimming or occasional renovation, taking it all the way to the ground. Others need very little attention. So the ones on the left are gonna need annual trimming and tying, some of them, whereas the ones on the right very rarely need any pruning. How often does the plant need dividing to do well? If I suggest that a plant, the solution to the question of the dead center is you need to divide that plant, the response I get is, do I have to? <laughs> but overcrowded plants compete for nutrients and water. Perennials desperate for division will underproduce, bloom less, develop dead spots in the middle, or such as rhubarb offer smaller harvests and restricted airflow can lead to diseases. So dividing is necessary when the plant is ready to be divided. Some perennials such as peonies and hostas grow on gracefully for decades. You find them at old homesteads. They've been there a hundred years, they're doing fine. And they only need division to control their size or if you want more plants in your garden. There's a useful resource, it's underneath the black Thing, but at the extension at the University of Minnesota has a very good list of plants that need frequent dividing versus plants that are rarely needing dividing. I know I would lean toward the ones that need less dividing myself. And then is the plant a magnet for trouble? We know that some plants are simply more vulnerable to pests and diseases. Monarda is a wonderful plant, bee balm is a wonderful plant, beautiful blooms, doesn't flop for the most part if it gets enough sun, but it's very much prone to mildew, which is unsightly down the bottom right. It's very much um, prone to that. There are some cultivars that are less prone to it. So I would choose those cultivars, but even those cultivars, which I have had, still have gotten some mildew. They're just less prone to it. Of course, roses are prone to everything, <laughs> pretty much black spot, rust, you name it. Um, but they're worth it to some people. And if instead of having 20 rose bushes, you can keep up with five, you can still have roses, just not feel it too much of a burden. And then of course there are the, uh, the, the edibles, the eaters, uh, for example, hostas, beautiful plants, easy care, don't need dividing. They're actually quite drought tolerant. They just quit growing when they don't get enough water but they are deer candy. 
and slugs love them. So you can have your hostas, but you have to be aware that either you are needing to put a fence or do regular sprays, whatever it is you need to do, but they, they are magnets for trouble. Now the insect in the, on the black background, that is the azale azalea lace bug with some wonderful lighting that made it just like stained glass. But right now we're very vulnerable, the azaleas all over the area are vulnerable to the azalea lace bug. And rhodes too, yes. All of them in that, in that genus. So um, it's a plant that I would be cautious about planting simply because I know it may be vulnerable. Do I want that headache? Do I love the plant enough to plant it? I need to think about whether it's vulnerable. And these are quite, you can look it up. You can say, it'll say vulnerable too. These are the things to watch out for. And what are the potential bad behaviors of this plant? <laughs> and truly friends don't give friends these aggressive plants without a warning. I think aggressiveness is one of the worst behaviors that we get stuck with. So do the seeds take root easily? All those, that's autumn clematis, the white one, but they all take root easily. Now, if in there's some areas of my garden, I'm going great, but in other areas, not so great. Does the plant spread by underground runners? Asters, other delights, or multiply with surface stolons? And then are the roots massive and deep? Is this a lifetime commitment I'm making by planting this plant? Because I will never get rid of it. Such as comfrey on the top and then butterfly weed on the bottom. Some plants are just, they keep coming back. I've been trying to get rid of some acanthus for five years right now. Just doesn't matter how the tiny a piece is, it'll survive. And other plants be potential bad behaviors or unsocial habits, trees that make a mess, whether that's from fruit or flowers or huge dropping leaves or shrubs that sucker and take over. So I would be wary about planting any of those. I have Kusa dogwoods, which do make a mess, but I have it in a place that it doesn't matter. It's not gonna get on a path. It's just gonna fall. I actually end up with baby Kusa dogwoods as a result. So here's a summary of seven of the seven uh, plant queries to ask. And it, it might be that one or another is more important to you. If on your survey, you mark deadheading as one of the things you dislike, that you just don't like doing it, then that might be one that you want to be sure and ask about. Or is it staking, training, regular pruning that you don't like? Or do you just never want to have to divide? So it's, this is where you start looking at what are the questions that you're going to ask about the plant for your garden. I'll just give you a couple of the techniques that I use to reduce uh, the work. For color, for perennials primarily, I look at one whack plants. They're called one wax because I only have to cut them once. Often it's just, you know, after they've died down for the winter and I just have to take them back once. I can leave them until very early spring to make them good for winter coverage and um, helping the, the insects that are wintering under there. Others that it's to take off the fading blooms, but I only have to do it once. A lot of people on their helibors, the one on the top left, a lot of people, um, the English I know, they will take off all of the leaves in the winter so the flowers stand out. But you'll notice those, the leaves are still on the ground, which is what I do. I leave them for the winter and into the early spring to protect the ground from all the rain. And then I'm able to take off the faded blooms and last year's leaves at the same time, a one whack. 
So some of it is timing and your tolerance for untidiness plays into this. If you don't like the look of the faded flowers on something like the peonies, for example, although they will drop their petals, but then they leave the seed head. If you don't like that, then you're gonna go and do that earlier. So tolerance for in untidiness may create more need to do earlier. But these are all one whack plants that I put in my garden. And I also rely on shrubs that bloom with little pruning. The calicanthus on the top left blooms for about a month because they come in sequence more than all at once. That is probably Hartledge wine there which is very reliable and has a good sized bloom. Hebe's, the white fried egg look is the Carpenteria evergreen and has this burst of the, the flowers. All kinds of good blooms that require little pruning. I don't cut back any of these plants. But still, the glamour girl and the handsome stranger do entice me. I am ever hopeful, hopeful that this perfect plant will live gracefully in my garden. But I must be wary and I must be strong. <laughs> now, you can't see because of the um, texting at the bottom, but the bottom says, perhaps I'll put it in a pot and see how it goes. That is sometimes my compromise. Uh, for deer, what I do is I put the pot out in the deer zone. I have a one area that's fenced and then I have the front, which is not. And I put the plant there and give it two weeks because the deer <laughs> highway goes right by my house. Um, and if it survives those two weeks, then I'll put it in the ground. But I got tired of digging things up. So okay. that's my, one way I work less is that I don't plant it right away. But there are some beauties here. I don't know whether they'd all work, but <laughs> I must be strong. So here's a few pictures that I ran across while I was doing this <laughs> that I just couldn't resist putting in. <laughs> yeah, that's what I like about it. Yeah. Those old jeans, isn't that a good use for old jeans? <laughs> yeah. I love the sheep too. That's so well cultivated, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. Anyway, so thank you for listening. And then questions. How do you want to handle the questions, questions from the, from the <laughs> audience here? Then Kathy will repeat the question before she answers it so that the zoomers okay and do you want somebody want to monitor you want to monitor, monitor the zoom questions yeah, yeah. yeah. we do that yeah sure. yeah and zoomers um i why don't you probably the easy way is for you to use the chat function <laughs> oh so question uh, what did I do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Chat. If you, if you go online, they will have, you know, the support. <laughs> what was the question? She wanted to know about whether the, the oh, wire that Monty Don uses to, he, he makes those supports that are just half hoop with a prong at the bottom. She want to know whether I knew what wire he used, and I don't. But I think you can find out online. Yeah, it's a six gauge rebar. Stand over here so they can oh, okay. better. Yeah. Right. So you get it in your neck. Sorry. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm curious as to why you put uh, crepe myrtle in the messy category. Asked about crepe myrtle, why she considered it messy. Um, their flower drop can be pretty messy. Um, they do take a lot of pruning too. <laughs> yeah, but the, the mess comes from the flower drop. Because I've never had one that blooms that much. <laughs> well, this is, you're not in the South either. Yeah, not in the South. The South, they're much more prolific there. Okay. 
I'll make one observation about rhododendrons. Um, I have some fabulous ones that are probably 30, 40 years old, and I'm having a terrible time with the azalea bug. Um, but uh, someone quite knowledgeable said that those that have the indumentum, that real fuzzy on yes. the back of the uh -huh. leaves, are much more resistant uh -huh. to that bug. So if you have to replace or even considering new ones, um, make a point of looking for for those with the endumentum. They're kind of like teddy bears <laughs> on the back of the leaf. Oh, they're wonderful. They're beautiful. The flowers are not as, yeah, the flowers are not, and there isn't as much a range of color. They all tend to be kind of like all year round as the yeah. flowers aren't. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, will your slides be available? You have some great lists of Good and bad. You're, you're recording it. The question was whether Kathy's slides would be available. I am recording the presentation. Um, I, I guess my the rest of the answer would be if you have PowerPoint on your computer, I could send you the file and then you can open it and look at it yourself. We can put it on the website for for a while. And you anyway. can export it as a PDF. Oh yes, I can. I can export it as a PDF. Yeah. That's absolutely right. So yes, we will make the yeah for a yeah. couple of weeks. Yeah, for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Others. Chats. Any chat? No. Good. No, I guess not. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, I am going to turn off the video, she says. Oh, there it is. Okay.